not so long ago as I was traveling down the road at night passing through a small town in the middle of nowhere I suddenly saw a sign not a holy or mystical sign like a burning bush or a descending dove nothing so impressive as that in fact the sign was altogether unimpressive a decrepit neon sign that falteringly flickered its message into the darkness Moel <laughs> from the look of the sign the tea could have been broken or burned out for years and something in the ramshackle look of that place set me to thinking there is definitely a sort of a food chain when it comes to travel accommodations you have your five-star hotels with mints on the pillow and mini bars stocked with potent potables and Perrier in every room. You have nicely appointed inns, quaint and hospitable with cozy fireplaces and a gourmet breakfast. You have your efficiency suites that offer the added comfort of a living room and kitchen area to the weary traveler. And then you have your standard chain hotels nothing fancy just a safe warm place a step down from a chain hotel is probably a chain motel or motor court adequate but no frills and then at the bottom of the heap <laughs> you have your moel not quite adequate but no other choices Imagine with me what we encounter turning aside into a Moel. The burned out sign comes as a match set with a burned out night attendant who sits wreathed in apathy and cigarette smoke. The parking lot is scattered with empty beer cans and the shrubbery is hung with fast food wrappers either blown there or thrown there. The empty swimming pool is ankle deep in mousse, a green tinted mixture of muck and ooze. And every room holds its own sad story, especially during the holidays. Because who stays in a Moel? Well, not many who would actively choose to do so. Room 110 houses a family of five. Lost jobs cascaded into missed rent payments and then eviction notices. And this is where they've landed until things get better or worse. A pine branch decorated with foiled gum wrappers serves as their makeshift Christmas tree. And it's a wonderful life, ironically, fills the small TV screen. Room 111 as a young man who finally worked up the courage to tell his parents that he's gay, hoping that they might understand and accept him. They didn't. He's here because the next bus to anywhere doesn't leave until tomorrow morning, and the bus station threw him out for the night, too. Room 113 stands empty, still sealed with crime scene tape, with a vac vacant buffer room on either side. Luther Lee lives in room 115. No one really knows his story except that he fought in a war and he may still be fighting it sometimes. Somewhere between 50 and 70, no one can really tell. He makes the round of local churches, help agencies and street corners, eking out enough to cover rent and a little food, and when he's able, his medication. And in 116, there's a young couple, not married, expecting a child. Their car broke down a mile up the road and they could go no further tonight. If these people were given a choice, a real choice, the rooms of this place would probably stand empty. But when the world has gone topsy-turvy, when things haven't necessarily worked out, Beggars can't be choosers, even if it's not much. When there's no place else to go, a Moel can offer a stable place to stay.
a stable place to stay. A stable place. And now, of course, your thoughts turn with mine to another night, another time, another place of last resort. Another young couple expecting a child has heard a repetitive message. There's no room for you. We have no place for you. I'm sorry. You simply can't fit in here. Interpret that as you will. The message to this couple about to birth God's son has been so consistent, no room, no room, no room, that it seems almost like divine design, doesn't it? The Messiah will not be born in a five-star hotel with pillow mints and a minibar, not in a suite with a cozy living room area, not in a hotel, not in a motel, not in an inn. Instead, God enters the human condition in a stable place, the first Moel. Who would choose such a place? Each Advent season, we are reminded God would choose precisely such a place. If we fail to discern the message from the story of Jesus' birth, there is no mistaking the message from the story of Jesus' life. He consistently eschewed hotels for Moels and the path of privilege for the path of compassion. Dined with the tax collectors, the intolerable, touched lepers, the untouchable, offered dignity to the shame-filled, the unmentionable, granted forgiveness to the sin-filled, the unpardonable, associated preferentially with the unclean, proving that even if cleanliness is next to godliness, still uncleanliness can sit next to God. Throughout his ministry, the last came first, and the first, though loved, could wait until last. It was a love, a hospitality too radical for the world, and it probably got him killed. But from that love, we can discern two life-giving, world-changing messages. The first is God's radical promise in Jesus Christ to us and to the world. Wherever you are, in whatever circumstance, whatever broken place, there is nowhere that you are beyond my love. Nowhere. And that's an important message, a life-saving message to anyone who finds themselves feeling that they are bedded down in a place of last resort, a moel. You see... Moels have a curious and damaging effect on our human psyche. We look around when it's hard for things to get worse and we sometimes begin to believe that we deserve no better. We're ashamed to be where we are, as we are, in a broken place, a broken condition, a broken relationship. We may begin to think of ourselves as unworthy, untouchable, unlovable, unforgivable, merely forgettable. We think we're in a place God would simply never come to. But the story of the first Moel reaffirms for us there is no place that God will not come to us, to seek us, or to embrace us. Hear the words of our Moel Messiah. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He calls the homeless home, saying, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. 
But I also spoke of a second message. The second message Christ's love lifts up to us is, if by grace or good fortune you do not find yourself in one of life's many moels, go there. You cannot fully follow me without going where I go, loving who I love, showing help and hope and hospitality to those who find none elsewhere. You can't lift, lift people out of the muck without going into the muck. And that message is just as consistent in Scripture as the first. I have blessed you so that you will be a blessing. Of those to whom much has been given, much will be required. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for widows and orphans in their distress. And in the clear terms of our scripture lesson from Matthew's gospel, as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it to me. As you've done it not unto the least of these, you have done it not unto me. So we receive the message of the one who comes in the manger Moel room. The poverty of the family in room 110 is in no way apart from your privilege. The young man in room 111 who has been shamed and disowned by his family needs to be claimed and owned by yours. The homeless man in room 115, the pregnant teens in room 116, the refugees at your borders, the persecuted, the afflicted, the addicted, the ones whom the world walls off or abhors or ignores or turns away, the people in every Moel everywhere belong to me. I commend them to your care. That's the message. And this shall be a sign unto you. A great big run-down flashing neon Moel sign. You shall find your Messiah wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a stable, in a feed trough. Amen.